On July 20th, 1969, the crew of Apollo 11 landed on the surface of the moon. With just one small step for man, NASA and the United States had claimed the most significant milestone in the ongoing space race. In the race to be first, the moon was the biggest prize, but not the only prize. The Soviet Union had already claimed a number of firsts, including launching Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite in 1957, and making Yuri Gagarin the first human in space in 1961. But when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, the Soviets focused on a new goal, the world's first space station. In 1971, they succeeded. But tragically, there would be another first. The crew of the space station became the first and only people to die in space. In May of 1961, reacting to Yuri Gagarin's successful spaceflight, President John F. Kennedy stood up before Congress and announced that the U.S. would put a man on the moon within the next 10 years. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. That became the focus for both the U.S. and the Soviet Union. But eight years later, in 1969, when Apollo 11 landed humans on the moon, the race was won by the U.S. In response to losing the moon, the USSR abandoned their own lunar landing ambitions in favor of a new goal, the first ever civilian space station. And they succeeded. Just two years later, on April 19, 1971, the space station Salyut 1 was launched into orbit. The Soviet Union developed, built and launched the station with surprising speed. They achieved this by combining two existing programs. The first was the Soyuz program. The second was a highly secret military program called ALMAZ. Space had become another frontier in the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. And both countries were researching the military applications of spacecraft. They were particularly interested in orbital reconnaissance. The ALMAZ project went into development in 1964 and was intended to be an orbital reconnaissance station. The US had a similar initiative in development called the Manned Orbital Laboratory, or MOL. By combining an ALMAZ shell with Soyuz components such as orbital maneuvering engines and solar arrays, the Soviets were able to ready a space station for launch in less than 18 months. The launch of Salyut 1 took place on April 19, 1971. Nine minutes later, Salyut 1 reached orbit and began deploying its solar arrays and antennas. Soviet engineers had outfitted the station with a variety of equipment for solar, astronomical and Earth observations. Unfortunately, the protective cover for the main scientific sensor bay failed to jettison, limiting many of the planned observations. Just four days later, on April 23rd, Soyuz 10 lifted off from Launch Pad 1 at Baikonur Cosmodrome. The Soyuz 10 crew planned to stay aboard Salyut for a month, but the spacecraft could not achieve a hard docking and the crew couldn't transfer into the new station. With limited supplies aboard their spacecraft, the disappointed cosmonauts departed the station after five and a half hours. They returned to Earth making a safe, but rare, night landing in Kazakhstan. Soviet engineers got to work immediately, redesigning the docking probe and updating docking procedures. Within weeks, Soyuz 11 was ready to make another attempt at docking with Salyut 1. Soyuz 11 was led by one of the USSR's most capable cosmonauts, Alexei Leonov. Six years earlier, Leonov became the first human to step out into the blackness of space and successfully complete a 12-minute spacewalk. 
the Soyuz 11 launch was scheduled for June 6, 1971. But just three days before the launch, during a routine medical examination, doctors found a swelling on flight engineer Valery Kubasov's right lung. Fearing tuberculosis, the whole crew was replaced by their backups. Kubasov's condition quickly improved, proving his diagnosis wrong. The inflammation turned out to be due to a pollen allergy. But space program leadership stood by their decision and proceeded with the backup crew. The new crew was led by Commander Georgi Dobrovolsky, an eight-year veteran of the cosmonaut corps. Dobrovolsky was about to have his first flight in space. He was joined by another first-time flyer, research engineer Viktor Patsayev and flight engineer Vladislav Volkov, who had flown in space as part of the Soyuz 7 crew. For the replacement crew, it was not a happy development. They had been training for barely four months and would be required to fly into space and take on a grueling mission in just a matter of days. Only Volkov had flown before and he had no docking experience. In his memoir, Two Sides of the Moon, original mission commander Alexei Leonov recalled the palpable sense of dread permeating Bakanor in those final days. But on the morning of June 6, 1971, that sense of foreboding seemed to have disappeared, and Dobrovolsky, Volkov, and Patsayev smiled and waved as they boarded the elevator at the launch pad. At 7.55 a.m., Soyuz 11 lifted off from Bakunur Cosmodrome, and 24 hours later, reached the space station. Soyuz 11 was piloted to within nine meters of Salyut 1. Tension was high, as the crew attempted to manually dock. Three hours later, they succeeded. Sensors had shown that six of the eight fans in the space station's environmental control system had failed, leaving the air inside the station smoky and unpleasant. Once the pressure equalized between Soyuz 11 and Salyut 1, research engineer Viktor Patsayev entered the station, turned on the air regenerator, and replaced the failed fans. He returned to Soyuz 11 and the crew waited 24 hours until the air quality in Salyut 1 improved. On June 8, 1971, the crew enter Salyut 1 and take control of the station for the first time, making an orbital correction maneuver and orienting the station and its solar panels towards the sun. The world press reports a new Soviet victory, the world's first space station. Salyut 1 had 99 cubic meters of pressurized interior space, far more than Soyuz 11's 9 cubic meters. And during the record-setting 24-day mission, the crew carried out a series of experiments in astrophysics and biology and served as test subjects to study the effects of long-term weightlessness on the human body. They also frequently exercised to combat the effects of weightlessness and stay fit for the grueling re-entry that was to come. And in another first, Viktor Patsayev turned 38, becoming the first person to celebrate a birthday in space. A fire broke out on June 16th due to an overheating piece of equipment, and dense smoke filled the space station. It was quickly brought under control but it underlined just how perilous life on board the station was. For the crew, however, the greatest challenge was monotony. At least one crew member needed to be awake at all times, and the unending shift work became a grueling marathon. But on the evening of the 29th of June, the mission came to an end, and the three men departed Salute 1 and took their places in the Soyuz 11 descent module for their return to Earth. The crew of Soyuz 11 were returning home heroes, having successfully completed their work on the space station. Dobrovolsky closed the hatch and sealed it, the separation commands were then initiated, and Soyuz 11 successfully undocked from Salyut 1, taking these pictures as the spacecraft departed the station. 
Three hours later, the cosmonauts fired their ship's engine to return to Earth. In one of the last communications with Mission Control, Volkov jokingly asked flight controllers to ensure that a supply of cognac, a traditional welcome home gift, was waiting for them at their landing site. 29 minutes before touchdown, while still in an altitude of around 120 kilometers, explosive charges fired to separate Soyuz 11's orbital and instrument modules. The bell-shaped Soyuz capsule was now the crew's only defense against the fiery furnace of re-entry. 22 minutes before touchdown, military radar detected the rapidly descending capsule entering Soviet airspace. Because the craft was still re-entering the atmosphere and sheathed in superheated plasma, communications remained impossible. Ten minutes before touchdown, helicopter crews spotted the undamaged Soyuz 11 swinging gently beneath its parachute. There was still no word from the crew. Within two minutes of touchdown, search and rescue personnel reached Soyuz 11. They made their presence known by hammering their greeting on the ship's hull. There was no reply from within. When they opened the hatch, they made a horrifying discovery. All three cosmonauts were slumped over, motionless. Their faces were covered with dark spots, and blood seeped from their ears and nose. The search and rescue crew removed the cosmonauts from the capsule and desperately tried to resuscitate them. The first contact between the ground crew and mission control took the form of three numbers. One, one, one. It was a code to denote each cosmonaut's condition. The Soyuz 11 crew, Georgi Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev were dead. These were the first, and so far only, deaths to occur in space. Soyuz 11 was at an altitude of about 120 kilometers, 20 kilometers above the Kármán line, the arbitrary boundary that denotes where Earth's atmosphere ends and outer space begins. When explosive bolts separated the Soyuz into its three components, with the crew inside the middle bell-shaped descent module, this was the moment that tragedy struck, just 30 minutes from landing. The shock from the explosive bolts jarred open a pressure equalization valve that normally opened only once the spacecraft was descending on its parachute, well inside the Earth's atmosphere. But in this case, the valve opened to the vacuum of space, and the capsule's air escaped in less than a minute. There's evidence that the cosmonauts tried to respond to the emergency by manually closing the valve, a process that took several minutes, but they quickly lost consciousness as the pressure continued to drop. Not wearing pressure suits, they had no hope of surviving. Just two minutes after module separation, all three men lost their lives. The Soviet government posthumously awarded Dobrovolsky, Volkov and Patsayev the hero of the Soviet Union Medal. The bodies of the three cosmonauts lay in state in Moscow before being cremated and interred in the Kremlin Wall. As a direct result of the Soyuz 11 accident, future Soyuz missions were delayed for over two years. As the valve system was redesigned and significantly, all future crews would wear pressure suits throughout launch and landing. Since that tragic day in 1971, every Soyuz crew has safely returned home. On August 2nd, 1971, exactly one month after the funeral for the Soyuz 11 cosmonauts, Apollo 15 astronauts deployed a plaque on the moon dedicated to fallen astronauts and cosmonauts, including Dobrovolsky, Volkov and Patsayev, a trio that will forever be remembered as the first ever crew of a space station and tragically, the first human fatalities in space. By the time Soyuz missions were ready to fly again, Salyut 1 was running out of fuel. It was decided to conclude the station's mission 
and on October 11, 1971, the main engines were fired for a deorbit maneuver. After 175 days, the world's first space station burned up over the Pacific Ocean, making the Soyuz 11 crew the last and only people to have called the station home. There's one more thing to mention, and that's the persistent myth that the Soyuz 11 crew were not the first men to die in space, and there were other cosmonauts who lost their lives in orbit in the days before Yuri Gagarin's successful space flight. The early Soviet space program was renowned for its secrecy. During the Cold War, information about flights and their success or failure was carefully controlled. In this atmosphere of limited information and intense pressure and anticipation over the prospect of human spaceflight, a rumor took root. The Soviets had covered up deaths in space. It became known as the Lost Cosmonaut Conspiracy. It's now known that the Soviets did cover up disasters and accidents within the space program, but there is no evidence to suggest they ever covered up any deaths in orbit. Advocates of the lost cosmonaut theory point to recordings made by two amateur radio operators in Italy. Critics question the authenticity of the recordings, but one, recorded in 1960, allegedly features an SOS message in Morse code from a troubled Soviet spacecraft drifting away from the Earth. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. And if you want more outer space content, here's a video exploring the connections between Halley's Comet and the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster.